to be celebrating this wonderful man and his extraordinary life here in the Academy, a place where he was very dearly loved and enormously valued, and to be doing so amongst so many of Ollie's greatest admirers, friends, and colleagues is a remarkable privilege. Apart from welcoming you all here tonight, I want above all to thank Ollie's family, especially Sonia and his nearest and dearest for bestowing that particular gift on us. Of course, Ollie was himself a kind of gift from somewhere delectably rare, probably somewhere rather exotic, and probably, as the Bible would say, from a land of plenty. The richness of his humanity emblazoned in a glorious canvas of passions expressed in his unpredictable taste for particular music, people, wine, culture, film, and much else, is what made Ollie such a magnetic presence and has made our loss feel so strong. I speak as someone who six years ago barely knew Ollie, which means that I stand here with considerable humility amongst a majority of you who've known him forever. But length of service isn't everything, so the HR manual reminds us. As I told my better half not long ago, I reckoned I'd never got to know someone quite so well over such a short period of time as I had with Ollie. In all good friendship, what makes a particular bond defies coherent reasoning. With Ollie, it was something to do with that alchemy of shared interests, values, fun, belonging, warmth, kindness, and very particularly in Ollie's case, his irresistible brand of humor, peppered with benign mischief. Recall that languidly delivered remark consummated by the lovable guffaw peeping through the druidical beard in silent ecstasy. I always thought that if Ollie didn't tell at least one joke at my expense during an academy visit, then he was either in a lot of pain or I'd been relegated to the realm of the vat man. I feel my principal task standing here is to acknowledge Ollie's generosity and his unmistakable contribution to the lives of hundreds of young people, whether here in Tanglewood, Snape, or anywhere else. He truly loved working with young composers. After a full day teaching in the patron's room, fueled by vintage Diet Coke, he would regale Phil Cash and me with blow-by-blow -blow accounts of how each student had progressed or what experience someone needed to embark upon the next stage. It was proper old school, big-hearted mentoring, and his unique place in our performing life here still resonates in the memory of those supremely fine concerts from 2013 onwards, and of course the uh, now legendary Soldier's Tail Disc, a performance further immortalized by the sullen soldiery of Sir Harry and the pathologically demonic instincts of Sir George. Ollie would not have liked a formal homage as such, so I'll finish with a demonstration of the frivolity which sat so comfortably with Ollie alongside the serious business of music. As with others, he and I enjoyed, uh, much enjoyed a, a kind of parlor game, either in person or on the telephone, sharing a metaphorical anorakism in the obsessive art of, you've guessed it, record collecting. And Ollie could be obsessive, whether it was about Owls or Mierzkowski's symphonies. But with records, we each fatally felt a greater degree of authority than the other. And in a spirit of childish competitiveness, one-upmanship was the name of the game. Three days before Ollie died, he was here receiving his honorary doctorate. You've probably seen the wonderful picture taken of him by Phil Cashin. Ollie had been psychologically scarred a month before by a pirate disc I'd acquired of outtakes from a Stravinsky recording from Utah, which I'd picked up in his beloved Japan. Hurrah, he hadn't got it. <laughs> and whilst grudgingly grateful, his peak was still fairly evident. During the doctoral procession, Ollie, covered in a mountain of red, silken ermine, surrounded by HRHs, vice chancellors, lord mayors, you name it, saw that his moment had arrived. Walking up to Walton's rousing Spitfire prelude, he stopped with some purpose and handed me 
a pirate recording of Hindemith conducting Bruckner's Third Symphony. <laughs> With the all-important smirking aside, it's the first recording in the second version. <laughs> now, <laughs> gowns, you may remember, have no pockets. So for the rest of the ceremony, I was holding this blasted record. <laughs> Even during my address to the graduates, with Ollie out of the side of my eye, smugly and triumphalist, perched on his doctoral throne, I didn't need to tell him that Hindemith's Bruckner III was not in my collection. He'd won the whole series on that single performance. I was never going to cap that. In the circumstances, I couldn't be happier that he'd had the last laugh. Tonight, we celebrate Ollie and all the irreplaceable friendships with those both here and far away. Personally, I can only express and feel enormous gratitude and pride that I knew him, even for that short time, alongside the continuing sorrow. Thank you. He used to go up quite quickly in the old days. But time's hard for gorillas, you know. All right, now let's have a go at this guy. I never use that. It's just they're warning me that time is ticking past. Now I can obliterate the both of them with this.
Not a day has gone by without me wondering what to say about Ollie. It's been difficult for me to think about him without getting confused and upset. I met him 65 years ago on the day I auditioned for the third horn position with the Scottish National Orchestra. He was a year old. His father, Stuart, who was principal bass player there, took me to his home in Mulgai near Glasgow on his Sunbeam motorcycle. A frightening experience for both of us, as I was a poor pillion rider. There I met this remarkable boy, Ollie. When his father held up a 78 record of Tchaikovsky's Sleeping Beauty, Stuart literally held it up. He didn't put it on the record player. Ollie could recognise and sing every side of every record. Once I became a member of the orchestra, I spent hours in the Nassim household, and in Mulgai and later in Watford, when Stuart and I were both in the London Symphony Orchestra. This is how I became Uncle Barry. One day, when Ollie was about 15 or 16, he announced that he wasn't returning to school anymore. Naturally, his parents were concerned, and I, as Uncle Barry, was detailed to persuade Ollie to complete the few months of school he was obliged to do. I did my best, but he just refused to give in. I was very impressed. <laughs> when Ollie lived in Snape, I'd visit him whenever possible, and I have clear memories of watching him sitting in the kitchen of his tiny gingerbread house, spending an hour to write one note, or sometimes none at all. There's little I can add to the many tributes and obituaries about Ollie as a composer, his marvellous talent and importance in the musical world. Of course, it's well known that he wrote the most wonderful horn concerto for me. This remains an honour professionally. Personally, the references within it to his father always bring me joy. You can hear them on track eight, two minutes and 34 seconds on the record we made. I'd also like to contribute one personal observation about his conducting of Webern's music. He not only got it all together, well balanced and in tune, Ollie made it sound like music. Oh, amazing Ollie. Where do you even start to talk about him? We go back a long way. In fact, it was our fathers who first met in typically a hotel bar in Hong Kong and talked about their musical sons. And because Ollie, having just conducted his first symphony with the LSO, had won hands down. Uh, it's amazing we weren't more suspicious of each other when we finally met in our 20s. And then we became firm friends. And I, like everybody else who knew him, got to understand his incredible generosity and warmth, and also particularly his generosity to other composers. Of course, I grew to love his music very, very quickly, but through his tutelage, I learned all kinds of music I would never have heard of. I realized I met Takamitsu through him, I met Dutier through him, I met Magnus Lindberg through him, Whenever I needed to know what was the next great piece to do, he was always there, ready, and never talking about his own music, always about everybody else's music. And of course, there's far too little of his wonderful music. But even again last year, playing the Third Symphony with the LSO, we all were so taken with how extraordinarily fine and sensuous and deeply thought out it was and it just came out in all its glorious colours like a new thing and a wonderful funny man I just have so many memories of time with him and Sue uh, and wonderful Sonia who thank goodness is here with us uh, we miss the man mountain as my kids called him enormously and we love him, he lives on in our hearts. Ollie, thank you for everything.
think I'm next. Hello. Is that right? <laughs> I've been asked to say a few words here about Ollie, or Big Owl, as he was known to Milo and Emily, my two kids, and with special help from my beautiful partner, Rachel. This is both the hardest thing I've ever had to do and one of the proudest moments. I first met Ollie when I was 16. It was the first time I was going to meet a real composer, a composer I'd heard of because I'd seen his picture in the previous season's prom prospectus. I was so excited, I blurted out, you're Oliver Nusson, and he was astonished that I knew who he was. <laughs> I instantly liked him, and we got on straight away, which has rarely happened in my life. He was the kindest and most generous person I've ever met. I had very little confidence, but during the early lessons, he would say, you are a composer, I believe in you. He always believed in me with this unconditional and never-ending kindness and sincerity. For large parts of my life, he has been the only one to believe in me, and now Ollie is gone. I miss him so much, and I know that I always will. Ollie introduced me to so much music, and along with that, he gave me so many special and precious memories. One being looking after Sonia with him one day when Sue was out shopping. Sonia was about six months old at the time, and she was lying on a very large cushion in the middle of the floor, listening to Zanarkis' Pithocracta. <laughs> I hope that has damaged her. <laughs> Ollie was always so incredibly proud of Sonia and talked about her all the time. She truly was his pride and joy. Shortly after I met Ollie, I began studying with him. My parents didn't have a phone, and I used to walk to the phone box down the road where Ollie would phone me back. We talked for at least an hour, sometimes five days a week. Remarkable now to think that he would so freely give me his time when he must have been busy, but that's what he was like. As a teacher, he was the best. He taught me how to orchestrate a little piano piece I'd written by literally scoring it out in front of me and guiding me through step by step. I learned more about writing for orchestra in that hour than all of my other studies put together. This he continued right up to just before he died. I trusted him completely. I would say, OK, Ollie, rip me apart. And he would laugh while making tiny annotations in his beautiful handwriting. He knew how to spot weaknesses, and he always had solutions. Ollie meant much more to me than the words I've spoken today, but I can't articulate the effect and importance of him as a person and as a musician. All I can say now is that I love Ollie and will forever be grateful for everything he's ever done for me. I will miss him every day. Thank you. I'm honored and saddened to be speaking these words today in memory of Ali Nassim. I cannot imagine my life without his presence in it. He was such a bright spirit and just brought incredible joy and the power of his investigative mind to all of us in so many ways. I met him, I think, the first time backstage around the concerts, my very first concerts with the LSO in 69 or 70. And then there he was at Tanglewood. I can still see him. I could see him this very summer sitting there uh, around the then cafeteria just near the theater and we were sitting down at those benches and talking about all manner of things in music because I soon discovered that he was like me, a complete musical omnivore. He knew and heard everything or was on the trail of hearing everything. One of our happy discoveries was that we were perhaps two of the few people in creation who could sing between the two of us a solo performance of Stravinsky's Aldous Huxley variations. <laughs> uh, it got kind of difficult in the 10-part uh, uh, counterpoint, but we kind of uh, sang bits and pieces and squeaked and I think gesticulated when we couldn't go any further. Uh, that was also the summer I remember being at the West Barn and uh, are going down there for something that was happening in the drama program and the fields were full of flowers. So just as a lark, I said, oh, let's pick all these flowers and arrive at this rehearsal uh, with flowers in our hair. This was 1970 or so. So we pulled up and we kind of peeked through uh, the window at the rehearsal and caused 
quite a stir. Uh, and one of the people who was at that rehearsal was Sue. And I think that was one of the first times that she and Ali met. So there was this beautiful kind of family connection between all of us, which when I came to England expanded to all the wonderful extended family of Ali, like uh, Colin and all the Matthews and Robin Holloway and oh, just so many others. Like the legions of students that I think of over the years that Ali introduced me to and took such pride in their advancing into their own major careers and the guidance he gave to so many people to find their own original path. It was incredibly uh, generous. In the United States, he was no less generous. He was working with major orchestras, notably Cleveland, but many others as well, as well as his role in Tanglewood, and he was such a champion of all kinds of music. Uh, he could make the most difficult music seem elegant and even uh, an adventurous pleasure to explore. Uh, what he did for Elliot Carter's music was extraordinary, but he was nonetheless a champion of people like Stockhausen or Lou Harrison or just Mayakovsky. I mean, the most extraordinary range of, of things. He was such a, a perfectionist. He did have a kind of sense of humor about it. I, I remember in one of the periods going over to the West End Lane apartment and there he was working on the arpeggiation in the harp part in one of the interludes and I can't remember it was Wild Things or Higgledy but I, it was bars and bars of harp chords and he was working out the exact sequence of the arpeggios. It was getting very close to the actual day of the first rehearsal. So I left him there and a day or so later I came back and he was still working on arpeggiating those harp chords. He said, Ali, for God's sake, why don't you just say, freely arpeggiate until such and such, and then sometime in the future you'll come back and you'll, you'll figure it all out exactly the way you want. He said, no, 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 it doesn't work that way for me. I have to get it absolutely right at this moment because it could be that somehow the world would be destroyed or my part of the world would be destroyed and the only thing remaining of me and my thoughts would be these few bars of this harp part. And I want people to be able to work out just from seeing this harp part, what kind of a guy, what kind of a mind I really am. And I just smiled at him and said, bless your heart, Holly. <laughs> you're gonna do what you're gonna do. I know it's gonna be wonderful. Recently, I was playing Ophelia's last dance on the piano. And I was struck at just how sensitive and musical a piece it is, what special touch it requires, and the very, very subtle sense of rubato that's necessary for its understanding. It's way beyond what the notation asks for. It's the kind of sensitivity he's looking for that a really thoughtful, caring performer will find and hear. And there's plenty of room in his music for performers to find their own expression as well as the very special world that he so beautifully and generously shared. We love him. We miss him.
It's hard living in an Ollie-less world. It's hard for his family and friends, for the incomparable Zoe, and for his utterly adored Sonia. Of course, all those wonderful, wonderful scores remain. But I feel sorry for audiences in the future who will not be able to witness the sheer brilliance, authority, precision and exuberance of Ollie's conducting. And in particular, there are the future young composers who won't be able to benefit from his extraordinary capacity for empathy, his generosity, let alone his encyclopedic knowledge and uh, his technical brilliance. And yet, most of the time, when I think of Ollie, it makes me smile. And I suspect that many of you feel in the same way. For nothing can ever take away the joy that he brought in to our lives, both through his greatness as a musician, but also through his extraordinary personality, his sweetness, his generosity, and that incredible sense of humour. If in heaven there's a special place reserved for composers, then I suspect that Claude, Alban and Igor have just had the most wonderful few months. It happens maybe only once in a lifetime that you meet someone as if you know each other already from decades. I have still, my memories to the first time that I met Oli in the late 80s are still as it was yesterday. It was still as it was yesterday that we were sitting at the kitchen table, table in Stockbridge preparing the performance of Stockhausen Gruppe. And that is a very serious thing to do, but at the same time it was also hilarious. <laughs> and it had all to do with this unlimited character of Ollie's presence. Uh, he was unlimited in his knowledge, and I've always wondered where is his knowledge coming from? It is not only music, it is everything. It is visual arts, it is literature, it is film. And I, I was always so impressed with that, by that. But on top of that, it was not a knowledge of facts only, but of a deep insight. It, it was really a passionate, a real passionate understanding. And the same unlimited side was in his generosity, the way he supported always unconditionally his colleague composers, and in the same time so extreme modest about his own composition. There's, for me, no doubt about that Ollie's legacy. In the first place, his own beautiful music in that beautiful handwriting. It is the many, many brilliant recordings he made. And maybe, above all, the warmth that will beg that Ollie will stay for, with us forever.
think maybe one of the smartest things I've ever done was in a very nice restaurant in Alicante between the starters and the main course to show Ollie a piece of paper with two concerts of his music on it and ask him if we were to do both concerts on the same day at the academy, would he come to them and do a bit of teaching? He said, yes, the concerts are fantastic and of course he was amazing and very soon was coming in every few months to teach as the Richard Rodney Bennett Professor of Music. He made an incredible impact on the place and some of the composition students he taught are going to share a few of their memories of him with you. Um, in a lesson with Ollie once, I played him a piece of mine and um, I asked him if the piece was boring. Um, he didn't answer that question, but what he did say was that being a good composer was like being a good dry stone waller in that you would find a place for every stone. So one of the most profound things I've learned from Ollie was to be bold, to leave what you're good at with what you have and not to be afraid um, to get out of your comfort zone and uh, to somewhere else. So Ollie was always a very warm and witty teacher and the best person I can think of to have sitting next to you in the rehearsal of your own music. So for me, a particular fond, particularly fond memory um, was the week we did uh, in Albra on the advanced composition course in 2015, where each day he would come and join us in rehearsals and uh, just offer subtle little nuggets of information to the composers and performers, which always helped bring our music to life with new clarity. Um, he was always very positive, and I always left our lessons desperate to go and compose. So. Thank you, Ollie. Uh, my overarching feeling about Ollie is one of uh, great friendship and knowledge and love, essentially. It's not often you can make a friend who can teach you how to orchestrate a string quartet or your new orchestral score and then take the time to drop you an email when he knows things in your personal life aren't going you know, the best they can. And it was incredible to have such a friend. It was always such a great privilege to uh, have lessons with Ollie and uh, amazing to have a visiting professor who um, would, on the one hand, be able to dissect whatever piece he brought him in a matter of seconds and tell you what was good and what was bad about it, but also who uh, cared and remembered you and would check up on how your life was going, make you laugh and uh, maybe even offer you a Jaffa cake. <laughs> with someone who's... Um, as just fantastically talented and accomplished as Ollie, it's often easy to feel intimidated when you're taught either privately by them or in a, in a seminar. But Ollie was able to communicate a sort of raw enthusiasm and, and wonder at the power of music that regardless of what you were talking about, you always left more excited about music than when you entered the room. I, of course, miss Ollie's amazing and vast wisdoms as a teacher but um, I miss his friendship the most and his incredible humour and warmth and how comfortable he'd make anyone feel when they were around him. Um, he had a particular Ollie magic that you felt when you were with him and especially I felt it was really strong um, at his home in Snape. I had my last lesson there um, around his kitchen table um, it was a particularly unusual lesson because it was the only lesson where we didn't listen to, talk about, or look at any music. Um, we spent all afternoon uh, reading poetry, talking about poems. Um, went for dinner at the Crown as usual. And um, it was the only time we went for a little drive together. Um, he took me for a drive to show me his favourite memories, um, viewpoint stories around um, Snape and Thought Ness and um, a beautiful viewpoint from the top of Thought Ness Hill. Um, I'm really grateful that I have that memory and my other memories of my friendship and um, time learning with Ollie. I feel incredibly lucky to uh, have such great memories of lessons with Ollie um, and time at Academy. Um, and for me, one of the most striking things um, was that I can never bring enough scores to show him in my lessons. Um, because he gets through them all so fast um, and we'll end up talking about TV shows and I've got a particularly good memory of um, talking about Father Ted with Ollie in one of my lessons. Um, but yeah, but the reason why he got through the school so fast was, was not that he had little to say but that he was so efficient 
at um, dissecting exactly um, what I needed to hear um, and making me more inspired to continue um, and yeah that, that for me um, just showed uh, a small example of his, of his musical wisdom that I feel very grateful to have had. Telling him it was bad for him. <laughs> Ollie always refused to talk about snuffing it. But when pushed, he was really clear. No funeral, but concerts and parties much approved of. So I think it'd be chuffed to bits to see all of you here. So many of you who've travelled from all over the world just to be with him today. Um, along with the love tsunami of messages for Ollie that continue to pour in from all over the planet. Sonia and I would like to thank you so much for coming and also give hugest thanks to all of you who've made tonight possible. You know who you are. It's been a real team effort. Although it's impossible to thank you individually right now without things turning into a kind of nightmare award ceremony, um, I know that Ollie would start haunting me in seriously annoying ways if I didn't give special mention to our ridiculously generous and wonderful hosts, the Royal Academy of Music, where... Yeah. <laughs> Ollie had such a happy hi uh, time here for the last five years when he was teaching. And I also have to give special mention to this phenomenal bunch of musicians that we've been listening, playing his music tonight. <laughs> Award ceremonies weren't really Ollie's thing. At the few he went to, he, he tended to go into this kind of anti-establishment, loose cannon mode and behave really badly. <laughs> he and Harry Birtwistle were officially banned from sitting next to each other at the RPS Awards after a spectacular bout of heckling a couple of years ago. <laughs> you know, it's really hard to believe he's not sitting there right now waving his flame walking stick and trying to put us all off. He, he probably is. Anyway, here goes. Those who've hung out with Ollie for any length of time will have come across Ollie speak, a language that morphed according to who he was with, but nevertheless contained some staples. Composers you might be familiar with include Beethoven, Mozart, and Schubert. Then there's Scridjarbin, Vrunjak, and Tizzle, or Lizd. Then there's Batch and Chopin, um, both of whose music he consistently and idiomatically loathed. Um, then there's Rip Your Corsets Off, Rimsky Korsakoff, <laughs> Modeste and his opera Doris Goodenough. <laughs> and the 20th century avant garde including Miss Cyan, otherwise known as Froggy Ollie, and his quartet for the end of term. Uh, <laughs> then Milton Bunny, Stockhoven and Boozle. Uh, while over here, we had Peter Mandy Maxwell House Rice Davis, <laughs> the vicar of St. Carnaby in all trends. Then there's the Albrough Power couple, Britney Spears. <laughs> and slightly off piste in this context, John Elliott Countryside. <laughs> Really importantly, we mustn't forget Richard Rodney Bennett's genius anagram for Ollie, Nurse Lovekins. <laughs> Visiting Ollie at home was to encounter a pretty much 24-7 immersion in music, interrupted only for Loose Women, that's a daytime TV show for those of you 
not you know too sophisticated to know. Although Ollie wasn't totally averse to the other kind, <laughs> um, <laughs> and interrupted also for the chase, TV show, and um, extensive phonal chirpage, to use the correct terminology. There was always a composer de jour, a total obsession in which every possible related seed, div book and recording was hoovered up until quite suddenly he'd announce, amidst the ever-expanding Snape Amazon forest, <laughs> gone off it. <laughs> and then the next composer would go on the jukebox. Possessing total recall, Ollie could mentally read off LP covers he'd seen just once 40 years ago. After hearing just a few seconds of a piece of music, he could generally identify not just the composer, but also the names of the musician, the date, the studio, the engineer. He could quote large chunks verbatim of pretty much any text he'd ever read or heard. And then he could also hear and see whole scores in different editions in his head, along with any corrections or markings, and then apply the knowledge as the need arose. This phenomenal ability to absorb and retain info across an astonishing range of topics came with a darker side. Arguments from the distant past would remain as vivid as if they just happened moments ago. And this almost superhuman gift was responsible in part for the more than usually vicious brand of inner demons that he had to deal with over the years. You know, I've always suspected that his Viking rock-hurling dimensions, as Henzer once put it, may have been partly symptomatic of this ever-accumulating burden of information, some of which spilled over from his subconscious in incredibly intricate and often hilarious, to me, dreams. Um, my personal favourite, which I'm sure he wouldn't mind me sharing, was in the dream he suddenly found himself at a party at the Boulez mansion. And he suddenly realized that he had to escape for his life. <laughs> suddenly, a beautiful chauffeurs in leather showed up outside in some incredible car, ushered him in, and they sped off. Overwhelmed with relief, our hero tapped his glamorous rescuer on the shoulder, who turned round and said, I work for Pierre. <laughs> Nasty stuff. <laughs> Ollie treated everyone as an equal, and his rare ability to shine the light of his fullest attention on whoever he was with, whoever he was speaking with, is one of the things that's made our big friend so loved and so hugely missed. The Queen got the same treatment when he went to collect his medal. Um, wearing, incidentally, a pair of trousers christened the Queen's trousers, <laughs> bought less than an hour before in greatest trauma from High and Mighty, a shop that has a whole new resonance now. Um, yeah, I didn't think that gag would work. Yeah. <laughs> Forgetting all about royal etiquette, he asked her directly if she remembered meeting six generations of British composers from El Garon, and apparently they chirped away happily for some 20 minutes. At the posh lunch afterwards, without HRH present, Ollie suddenly announced, everyone else has a pistachio ice cream ball on their ma raspberry meringue thing, and why don't I, and I want one. <laughs> and Within seconds, some shiny footman glided over and sorted it, and everyone carried on happily. But, you know, Ollie, he'd be the first to admit that his natural age was about three and a half. <laughs> the age where giants and dragons and wild rumpuses are real. Before you hear the last piece Ollie wrote, Oho Toto Gizu, a title he chose partly um, deliberately to piss off his publishers when trying to pronounce it. <laughs> I've heard some brilliant ones today. I think my favorite is Ho Totty Totty. <laughs> anyway, it's important before you hear it to know, um, if you weren't aware of this fact, that Ollie was big in Japan. Much loved by musicians and audiences, 
Queues of fans stretching around the block at his concerts and sushi chefs delighting in his extensive appreciation of Japanese nosh. Ori-san, as he was known there, had a great love affair with all things Japanese and copies of haiku books, Zen philosophy, kabuki and no plays and hokusai prints were always within reach at home. The Hototo Gizu is a Japanese bird that recurs throughout Japanese art and literature as an aesthetic device, often symbolizing death, transformation, and the spirit world. Oli's unfinished last piece is a luminous musical journey from this world to the next, which, let's face it, under the circs, is a bit spooky. A couple of weeks back, I spoke on the phone with Japanese composer Joe Kondo, who met Oli back in the 80s along with Toru Takamitsu. Joe confirmed that Oli had a particularly Japanese sensibility, a love of creating maximum aesthetic impact in minimal, exquisite form. I asked him what one thing he would say to Oli now by way of saying goodbye. Well, said Joe in his excellent English. I am older than Ollie and will soon be joining him. I'm looking forward very much to meeting with him again. So in this spirit, let us now gather up all our Ollie stories, the vast restaurant bills, <laughs> travels, hilarity, conversations, and above all, the music, which he spent his entire life in service to, and release them all into that transcendent dimension where time ceases to exist and music is born, and give him all our love as his tremendous soul makes its journey upwards to the next set of adventures. And for us, left here a while, the music continues. Rest in peace, beloved friend. Dearest Ollie. What's nice about talking to people who write music who are really good at it is it's like talking to people who work with wood, or it's like talking to people who make films, or it's like talking to people who, who, are, who love what they're doing and love the material that they're making it with. Um, not too many people ask the questions, you know, why make films, or my, why make chairs, or why make, you know, ornamental backs on chairs or something like that, and I don't see why we should be asked the same either.
the craft of making music. It's uh, along with being kind to people, to your fellow uh, uh, people, it's the most important thing there is.